Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 126, The Brad Larson Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we go back to a guy I met in my final NHL training camp of my career, hear his incredible hockey journey, and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, then I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Today I'm going to be speaking with an individual that I haven't crossed paths with since the fall of 2002, when we were both at the Colorado Avalanches training camp. He and his roommate at the time, Dan Hynote, let me stay there a couple weeks before camp started so I could get a little acclimated to the high altitude of the Mile High City. I'm sure we'll get to that shortly. Our guest today is none other than Brad Larson, a distinguished figure in the hockey world. Hailing from British Columbia, Larson's journey in the sport has been nothing short of remarkable. With a playing career that spanned over a decade in the NHL, his on-ice prowess and leadership left an indelible mark. But Brad Larson's story doesn't end there. Transitioning seamlessly from player to coach, he has proven his mettle behind the bench. A master strategist and motivator, Larson's coaching journey has seen him climb the ranks, having recently held the post of NHL head coach for the Columbus Blue Jackets. We'll start at the beginning, work our way through his hockey life to where he is today. So grab a coffee and settle into your favorite easy chair as we dive into another incredible hockey journey. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Brad Larson to the show. Mr. Larson, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Lance. It's a, it's a pleasure. It, it has been over two decades since you and I have crossed paths. Um, that's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, I'll tell you what, I've got, uh, I've got two kids now. 11, 14, I've, uh, I've grown up my beard for the first time since uh, the 05 playoffs. And uh, I got a lot of gray in there now that I didn't know I had. And uh, <laughs> it, it comes quickly. You know, the, the days turn to weeks, turn to months, turn to years very quickly. And I can't believe that I just, uh, this is my first year out of pro hockey in 26 years. I was in a 26 straight. So, um, yeah, you blink and it's over. It is. But you just, you kept, you stayed in it. Uh, and we're going to get to that whole thing. But just to set this up, how our connection, and it was over two decades ago when it was in Colorado. This was my last uh, attempt to play a year, a season in the NHL. And I signed, I was with the Florida Panthers. I signed with uh, Colorado. It was a two way deal. And somehow, I, I don't know. Hi, you were living with Brad or uh, Danny Hynote, and somehow I got connected with you guys, and you guys let me stay at your place. I came out there like two or three weeks before because I I wanted to try to acclimate to the altitude. It still felt like I smoked two packs of camels a day for <laughs> years up there, but uh, that's how the the connection was, and. Um, do you remember how we like how I ended up staying with you guys? Yeah, you you're right. So I used to come up there uh it was at least two or three summers in a row I'd go spend about 4 to 6 weeks with Danny. 
and he had he had access to a rink uh, that we'd skated every day and so we would we would do our training in the morning uh, off ice stuff and then we'd skate at night and I know we crossed paths in there somewhere I know we were uh, I actually remember I remember you were doing a bike ride and I, we were doing a bike ride beside you and I think you looked over and you're like what are you guys doing and <laughs> <laughs> and I said we're we're getting ready for for Hartley's camp because <laughs> Bob Bob had really hard camps and you know I I had already had him twice and so I knew what I was in for and I remember just going look like it's gonna it's gonna be taxing and so I think you had made the decision to come out early which I think was smart and and we already had a place and established there so you you ended up staying with us and then uh, I think true to the word it was a, it was a pretty tough camp yeah it was. One of us didn't make it out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, one made it, one did it. I'll we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, yeah, most people don't know, but that's how it is. <laughs> yes, yes. No, that was that was at the tail end. So awesome. We're gonna get going on all that stuff. But if you don't mind, what I like to do with all the guests that I have on the show is, uh, you know, take a few minutes and let's rewind the tape and go back to the beginning. You know, where did you grow up? What was your childhood like, your parents, brothers, sisters, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports? Basically, give the listeners a glimpse, a little tiny peek of what it was like growing up, Brad Larson. Well, pretty typical Canadian Canadian boy who, uh, I, you know, I lived in a farm, in a small place called Armstrong. Um, if anybody's been out as Western Canada, in the Okanagan, there's Kelowna, Vernon, Penticton, Kamloops, and then there's this little tiny pocket of Armstrong, a small farm town, and we lived on a five-acre farm out there. And uh, yeah, I mean that's where it started. I'm three, four years old, had my first pair of skates, and uh, was just just playing hockey, having a blast with it. You know, I had an older brother who was six years ahead of me, and he uh, he was never a, a hockey guy. He he just kind of did his own thing. He was artsy and actually artsy in a way, but then you know he was a rugby player and uh, bodybuilder crazy stuff like that so um but i i just i i gravitated through hockey and that was my thing and my parents supported me uh just two typical canadian parents hard working uh, my dad was a uh, he worked in the mines and he drove a backhoe and and was at the end of a shovel most of his life hard working man and my mom was a receptionist and um you know i had two working parents who were uh, tremendously loving to me and uh, never never really push me um, but just instill the work ethic and and I had a passion for hockey and and then um, so I started there I moved to Vernon which seemed like a big city at the time city of 40,000 people well hold on before at, you get to before you get to Vernon and I apologize yep. for interrupting I do this no from, from time to time but sure. you know you said small town you lived on a farm um, did yep. you have did they you know your dad your mom, I mean, did they create a little uh, skating rink at uh, on the farm there? Did you have a, a little pond or a lake that you started? How did, how did you get, you know, the, your reps in besides uh, just your winter team? Yeah, so there wasn't any any ponds or lakes. Like, we, we did some of that a little bit later. Um, but what I did have is, you know, we had – my dad bought me – I love to shoot pucks, so I had – uh, plywood and we put wax on it which really in the end I don't think it was any smoother I think it was worse I think it created friction but <laughs> I would I'd be I shot puck after puck after puck um, just at this net and I had a little bit of a background I think he bought me 50 pucks and that's all I, I just shot for hours and um, and then you know tennis balls against the garage door I mean there was uh, it, it looked like uh, like cannons I got off there just, you know, cause it's wet and muddy and I didn't care, obviously <laughs> just shooting them, you know, all over the door. And so that's basically what it did. Now it would get cold and there'd be a little bit of freezing and that would be, I'd put my skates on and, and I, this little patch I said, set up my den and I'd shoot my pucks once the ice was there. Uh, but I, it wasn't to be skated on. Like it wasn't that big. It was just really an area to shoot. So I didn't do a lot of extra, I, you know, I, I played every sport growing up, I, you know, when, when hockey was over, I'd go play soccer or go play baseball or uh, basketball, whatever. Um, I did everything and I took the summers off for the, uh, other than playing outside, but no, no extra skating and that stuff. I just, and then I'd be excited for the season. When I got to Vernon um, a little bit later, we had, there was, there was lakes and frozen areas and we had an outdoor rink there that I used to 
beg my daddy he'd take me down all the time it was like two bucks and you could skate outside for two hours you know or an hour and a half whatever it was and I spent tons and tons of time there where you'd show up and there'd be you know six eight kids and you throw your sticks in the middle and you just play play a game play a game of post if the goalie showed up great and I mean I, I really believe that's where I I developed a lot of the skills it just you you're out there uh and just having fun you know the 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 game itself was pure then and and so I spent a lot of hours out there and then on the lake was always a riot whether whether it was on a little pond a lake whatever those times were were the best so um, as far as the farm that was most of it was on dry land it was shooting pucks off of plywood and and tennis balls that's what I did um but then yeah then like I said I moved to Vernon and that seemed like a big 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 transition it was my first triple a tryout and uh was fortunate enough to make the team and uh so we from this small town we ended up going all the way in and 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 winning this this peewee playoffs whatever it was and um you know ironically this is a small town we had we had four guys drafted off that team um you know matt Higgins was a first round pick to montreal uh jason Padolan was a high second round pick to florida um yeah actually Lance you might even have known him that name um you know, I was drafted and and uh Mike Ford was drafted so I look back you didn't really realize it but we had a from a small town we had a pretty good team um we went up went in provincials and stayed there a couple of years uh and back then it was different like there was no there was no high school hockey there's no uh once you got good enough midget wasn't really a good stepping stone uh, I'd left home at 15 years old um, I went and played junior B, so I was 15. I tried out for the Kelowna Spartans at, as a as an underage 15 year old. They said I could have made the team, but they didn't know how much I was going to play. And then a junior B team approached me from Nelson and said, "Look, you're you're going to play a ton." And my dad made that decision. He said, "Look, you need to play." So I, I I packed up, left home at 15, and moved in with the Billet family and played my uh, uh, junior B, uh, playing against guys that are 20, 21. It was a crazy league back then. I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> I was 15 years old, didn't know really what I was walking into. And I remember we played 42 games. I had 164 penalty minutes. There was brawls and fights. And I mean, oh, wow. it was, it was a crazy league back then. Um, and you're 15. So yeah, leaving at 15, getting that experience. I, you know, I, I talk to them now. I, I can't believe they let me walk out the door, to be honest with you. I get my, my daughter's 14 and my son's uh 11 and I, I don't see that happening with our family but um <laughs> but yeah i i was very fortunate i got a great billets um uh, very caring family that took me in and actually two other guys and really took care of us um you know i i think you know you all think you're ready at that point i you know i was 50 i was homesick for one day and then after that i i i was fine and but you know, you just, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And, and, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of life lessons that I would have done probably different at that time, but you know, you just kind of, you ran with it. You're trying to fit in and do all these things. So uh, my billets were fantastic. Uh, I learned a lot that year and, and um, you know, then, the, then the, the, the uh, WHL draft happened and I got drafted to Swift Current and I went, and decided, yep, that's the route I was going to go. So I played there for four years in Swift Current, and um, my my billet family were were amazing. They were like second parents to me. I was there sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Uh, absolutely loved me, took care of me. Uh, they loved me like parents would. They were they were amazing people, and I was so so blessed and fortunate to have that. Awesome. Um, yeah, I had some. Um, you know, within that, you know, we had some good teams, never, never a team to really make the Memorial Cup or type thing. We were always a playoff team, but kind of couldn't get past the second round. Um, but in, within that, I was very fortunate. I, I got to play for Team Canada um, three different times. One, uh, Team Canada under 18 team. Uh, we won gold medal. And then I, I played two world juniors also. And we what? won gold, gold you medal got, you twice. You yeah. two of those? Yeah. So I, I, I've, I was three times uh, I got to play and, and all three we won gold medal. So that was, that was a very uh, awesome experience. And, um, you know, I, just, I, I to have to just, the, I have to just give some, 
a lot of our listeners, I'm from Minnesota, so I'm sure that uh, we got a good chunk of uh, our listenership are, are from Minnesota, and they do not know the magnitude of the World Juniors. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like the Super Bowl. If you're up there, when I, I was lucky to play yeah. in Ottawa, I mean, it's incredible. So you, to, to be able to play in it three times and to win, to win it twice, did you win tw- two out of the three? So I played Team Canada under eighteen team, so that's okay, not that's World what, Juniors, yeah. But I. But you won a gold there. Won a gold there, yeah, and then, um, then I made two World Juniors back to back, yeah. So uh, as an eighteen boy, and nineteen year old, yeah, yeah, we won gold twice. So uh, my first experience was in was in Boston, Massachusetts, Ooh. and we won gold medal there. And then the next year we uh, we went to Switzerland and we won it there. So uh-huh. you, you're right. Like it, I grew up watching it. it it's it's uh yeah you're 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 not far off when you say it's the Super Bowl, especially for a young kid. I I remember winning gold and uh, the the second World Juniors. I was fortunate enough to be named captain. And I remember because you being named captain, you get a lot of there's a lot of interviews and a lot of TV time and, and right. TSN follows you. You don't really realize. I came back, we won, and I remember it was crazy. People recognized you and, and everywhere you went, and you didn't really realize it until. You got out of it. My first year wasn't as much because I was more of a uh, a role player and played on the fourth line. And, and second year, a little bit more of a checking role, playing with Alan McCauley and Boyd Devereaux. And that's kind of was our role. But being the captain, you got a lot of uh, TV time. Um, so, yeah, that was a big – coming right back at 19, that was a, a, was a, a, a very weird experience, just people recognizing you everywhere. And so, yeah, so being able to play for my country – Three different times was a, a tremendous honor, um, and, and again, I was spoiled because we won every time. So, um, not many people get that opportunity. I, I certainly don't take that for granted. Um, and then I got drafted. I actually was originally drafted. Kind of a crazy story. I was originally drafted by Ottawa. Uh, I was drafted first pick in the third round. At that point, it was fifty fifty third overall. And after I went through my World Juniors, I think it was the second year, uh, I got traded, and I got traded to Colorado. And so we we got to Colorado, and that's you know uh, Pierre Lacroix was there, and I remember they flew me and my parents into Detroit, my agent, and uh, we were watching the game there, and they did a presentation. I remember leaving. I'm like, man, I I have no chance to make this team. Like they're this is young Peter Forsberg and Adam Deadmarsh, and they the, the list was long of how many players they had, and. And so we decided we weren't going to sign with them and it wasn't over money. It wasn't, there, there was no bitterness. It was just, look, I, I just don't see the opportunity. And so we decided we're not going to sign there. So they came to us and said, look, that's fine. But if you're available in the draft, cause I went back draft, we may draft you again. And sure enough, I go back in the draft and they redrafted me this time it was in the fourth round and they got me in the fourth round. So no way. Yeah. So I was crushed. I was like, well, you kidding me? And uh, they were really good. Like they, they could have put the, the boots to me as far as signing bonus. They never did. They were great because um, it wasn't a bitter breakup. I just didn't see it anyways. Uh, it all worked out. It took me four years to kind of crack that line up full time. But um, yeah, everything happens for a reason. You look at it and, and man, I look back on that experience and I go that I, I, it was incredible that, that those teams that were there and what I was able to learn just being a small role. So you, you, you know, and, I, and I'll share to the listeners on this, you know, you, I grew up in junior and, and, you know, you, you're looked at as like captain Canada and, and all these silly things, right? Like I played the world juniors. I was, you know, one of the top scorers on my team and 80 some points and 36 goals and second all-star in the league and all that, all that stuff. Right. Wow. But all of a sudden you, you get to, you get to Colorado and you're surrounded by Peter Forsberg and Joe Sackick and, <laughs> and Chris Drury and Milan Hayduk and Alex Tongay and, and, and the list goes on. And, you know, Patrick Waugh, Ray Bork eventually got there, Rob Blake, and you're going, where do I fit in? And, <laughs> and you know, that pyramid gets gets pretty high. And so I, I had uh, Bob Hartley was my coach in the minors then my first year. And I played about – three or four games and he called me in and, and tore a strip off me and said, you're, you're not going to be able to play like that. And so I, I went through junior really like not, not being a, an antagonist, not really a scrapper, not none of that. And, and he basically, I, 
he told me I'm going to have to change. And, you know, I think you don't believe it as a kid. You think you can make it, but he was right. And I, and I had to, I had to adapt and, and learn a new role. And that role was, you know, how do I, I remember him calling me in and going after me. And I remember I fought three games in a row. I'd never done that ever. And I didn't do well. I just went out. I'm like, well, I got to do it. So I just did it and um, fought three games in a row. And then he got off my back on that. And then, you know, just trying to be physical more and just trying to, I always tried to play a well-rounded game. I, my favorite players growing up were Mark Messier and Wendell Clark. So I, I, I always, I loved how they had kind of the a balance of, of scoring plus toughness. And not that I was tough, but I wanted to emulate those players. Sure. And so, those were my, I guess, hockey role models. And, and so I was like, well, I'm going to have to, to change. And, and it took me some time. I mean, there was, it was a lot of ups and downs and going, man, this isn't going to happen. This dream is never going to happen. I, I lost, I remember my first year, I always thought I was a hardworking guy and in shape. And, and I remember after my first year from where I started to where I finished, I was down 22 pounds. And, <laughs> and I, because I, I didn't really know what work was. I thought I did. And then I was introduced to a, a whole nother level of work and man, and that, that kind of set the path. And so every camp, it, it just, you know, I, I, I very streamlined what my role was going to look like. And it took four years. It did. I, I, you know, the year they won the cup, I was there for nine games. Uh, that's when Ray was there and he got his, his Stanley cup and Joe and I, was, and then I was there for the whole playoffs. So I was very fortunate to be just part of that run. And, um, but I got to see, what what elite players like when you talk about Joe Sakic and Peter Forsberg and Ray Bork and uh, Rob Blake and and Patrick Waugh and you go through this list like these are Hall of Fame guys and but they were Hall of Fame people uh, really they um, everybody had their own personality Joe was very quiet um, but man when when the chips were down he always rose and he was calm and he was an incredible team. It's all these people there treated me like I was an important part of that team, even though I was only playing, you know, some nights, five, six minutes, but, but they, they shot, they, they showed me how important every role was and how they appreciated what I did. And I always kept that with me and, and, and appreciated how I was treated by such um, quality people. And, and to be part of that winning team and that culture. I, I Again, you don't know what a winning culture is until you're just kind of thrust into it. And I was in it. And and then, um, you know, I, I I was at 2001. I was there for the run. And then 2001-2 was my first full season. My first full season in the NHL. And we, we went to uh, actually my first full season. And then playoffs, it was three game sevens in a row. That was my first taste of NHL playoffs. So we, we oh, beat wow. LA <laughs> in game seven. And, and then we played San Jose. We beat them in game seven. And then we played Detroit. And we lost to them in game seven. That's the year they won. But in that series alone, I think I've counted. I, now you'd have to fact check me on this because I, I might be speaking out of turn. But I think there was somewhere between 12 to 14 Hall of Fame players in that series alone. Um between wow. our side, and then they had Brett Hall and Shanahan and um, Hashik and uh, Datsuk and Iserman and and you know the list is long. And then we had Ray Bork or no, Ray was retired then. Sorry, we had you know Joe and uh, Peter and and all these guys, right? So that series, I don't think you'll ever see a series like that again. Not with the salary cap system, anyways. Uh, yeah. just, you can't you can't afford that many. But so to look back on those moments and go, man, that was my first taste of, and and we knew you know, pretty much whoever won that series was going to win the Stanley Cup because it was Carolina waiting for us in the in the Stanley Cup finals. And um, we, both teams, I think, felt like this was the series that was going to going to be the decider who was going to win it. So, um, unfortunately, we lost in Game 7 in Detroit. We got thumped. Uh, we were up. We were going back home in Game 6, lost in Game 6 at home, and then lost in 7. And they just they buried us. They were just way better that game. And, so that was kind of my one chance to, we almost went back to back, but we never got it done. And, um, you know, then my career went from there. I, I hold on, kind hold of on. Was, so here, I, yep, I, yep. I want, I, I want to just touch on one thing. So how we got together and, uh, you guys were gracious enough to open up your place, uh, an yep. extra room, you know, for me to get out there a little early and then, uh, get through, uh, part of, uh, training camp. But, if if you ask anyone that 
you know, I'm close with, if I described my experience in Colorado, it would be that exactly what you are saying that there were, you had, <laughs> you had a Hall of Fame team, uh, but when every, when they got on, got to the rink, uh, I mean, they were a professional all the, all the time, but when they got to the rink, all of a sudden everyone's paid, started paying attention. And mm -hmm. I just remember that you knew exactly what the pace of practice was going to be because all of the best players on that team in that organization were also the hardest workers. And that doesn't happen mm -hmm. all the time. You know, we've no. all played with <laughs> leaders that, uh, you know, weren't the hardest workers talented, but that's frustrating when other guys are blocking shots and, you know, other guys are lollygagging a little more. So um, that's what I remember is that they just set the tempo every single day. And, you know, once you knew what it was, um, if you didn't get to that level, uh, it was like a spotlight was uh, you know, following you around on the ice. Yeah, the, like I said, the and, and now – you know, I've been at the highest level coaching too as assistant and as a head coach in the NHL. And um, all these experiences um, would always I would reflect on and go back on. And, and you know, it, you get to analytics, you get to all these things that have kind of come into the game now, which I, I think there's a place for them. There's no question. But you really don't have to, um, you don't have to overthink a lot of this stuff. Your, your, your ceiling is set by your best players and 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 that that's really truly it. it it's yes coaches are important you you need the right coaches the right team systems yes but what it comes down to is your your best players will dictate the ceiling of your team and and yes there's many talented players there is but I always call them the one percenters. There's there's the ones that like the Sidney Crosby's of the world the the, the guys that have that exceptional talent that also invest in every other part of the game. That's important. And and it's important to them because winning is, is a, really a selfless act in, in hockey. It can't be about you, but they, they have the ability to rise and calm themselves in, in the most intense situations. And I, I got to watch that firsthand. I watched Joe Sackett go about his business. He'd be in the gym, um, put three plates on each side on the squat rack and doing it. And, and, not bragging about it, not not making a spec. Just I remember talking to the trainer, going, "What is he doing?" Because we're doing different stuff. He goes, "He's getting ready for playoffs to playoff run." And, you know, this is, and you know, we're talking November. You know, and he's like, he, he's not thinking about playoffs. He's thinking about winning the Stanley Cup. Like he he's getting prepared for hockey in June. So he knew the importance of continuing to not maintain, but to build your body. Like you can't just maintain and. And just go, well, that status quo. That that was his mindset. Like he was he was five eleven, a hundred and probably ninety pounds, hundred but he's he's using eighty pound dumbbells on on sitting on a on an ISO ball and doing shoulder press. And <laughs> and I'm going, Wow, you know, that but that that was the standard. That's what I saw. So when I look back at that and go, No, that's just what we do. That's how you do it. That's how your leaders do it. So they they set the bar. Like Bob Hartley was a good coach, and, and there's great coaches that were there. But ultimately, your best players set the ceiling. And they did not – Like I mean, I remember being in a, a – I'll share the story. I won't get in great de to detail. But I remember in my first full year in San Jose, we lost game three in San Jose. And we had a you know closed-door meeting. And the series was two to one San Jose at that point. And, and uh, you know, uh, you know – Joe spoke and, 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 you know, we actually had Mike Keene who was a great leader. He spoke and Adam Foot spoke and, um, you know, it was kind of quiet. I think Blakey might've spoke a little bit. And then all of a sudden Patrick Law spoke and man, he started going after the leadership group and in a way, and again, I won't repeat it, but he went after them and I mean, called them out and there were some heated words and, but I'm sitting in the court as a fourth line guy, just shriveling. <laughs> What's he going to say to me? You know, but he understood that for us to win and and to 
to beat this team. It's not going to be guys like me or Danny Hynode, or It's going to take our best players. They were, minus the excuses, minus the, and he went after him. And, and I saw a group that that was accountability that I had never seen. Yes, it was an accountability group, but that was intense. But guys responded in a way, they weren't happy what they heard, but they responded with absolute professionalism. But they, I always go back to this, they were prepared for that moment. They, they, it didn't, the moment didn't overwhelm them because they have been preparing for years. They've been in these moments. They put the work in the gym. They put the work in the practice. So the way that they prepared and then, then the accountability, when your teammates spoke, you listened because they were, they all had a common goal and it was winning. It wasn't about their goals and assists and, and stats. It was about one goal and that was the Stanley Cup. And so like I remember going to other teams and everybody after the game grabbing the stat sheet, looking at goals and assists and ice time. I never saw that in Colorado, ever, ever. There was no – they knew. They knew if they played well. I, I remember sitting by Joe icing Sackick and him saying, I was garbage tonight. And I'm looking at him going, <laughs> I don't think you were that bad, but I guess, you know, that's fine. And, <laughs> you know, he, but but his standard was really high. And that was, that was a gift that I, I just – I wish every young player could go through and, and see that that standard, because sometimes young players get put in situations where they think, oh, it's the NHL and this is how it is. I'm like, no, not every NHL team is created equal. And to be a part of that was something that uh, I, I will never forget. I don't know if it can ever be put together like that because of, again, the salary cap, there's, there's all these different variables now, but, but still, the teams that are sustainable, the teams, their best players, you, you mentioned that the ceiling is so high and, and the selflessness that's involved in it and the care about about their teammates. Um, analytics, unfortunately, is never going to be able to quantify a number of, of how they treat their teammates, how they push each other in the gym, how they put an arm around a young guy and, and let him and make him feel appreciated, um, taking him to a lunch when they're struggling. Uh, all these things that 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 get overlooked in character and leadership and what that looks like. And when it comes from your best players, then you have something. Then you have something that's going to, to give you an opportunity to win because it's so hard to win the Stanley Cup. And even with all those elements, you still need a little element of luck and a timely save and, and, and try not to get key in, key injuries to key guys. Um, health, there's there's that on top of it. But But when you have that type of leadership, Coupled with the skill set, you you have an opportunity to do something special every year, and and I and this is something I've got into coaching, trying to uh, to teach and help younger players um, navigate through that the importance of 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 how you prepare yourself, and you know, and that doesn't mean not having fun. I mean, these guys they had a blast. Guess what? Winning's fun. They won a lot of games. You know, when when everyone's like, "Well, we're not having fun," you know, and I'm like, "Well, <laughs> it's no fun losing. It's just that's." That it's hard to have a great time when you're getting thumped every night, but when you're winning, um, how you approach the game, how you do it, how you how you do it as a, a unit, and these guys they got it, and and so I've always tried to pass that on to other players, um, just from what I saw, what I experienced, because I went to other teams and it wasn't like that, um, you know, it, it it certainly wasn't like that at all, and and you're scratching your head and you see different levels, and I've coached different teams now, and so. Um, so that experience in Colorado was, was, as you can tell, was, was something that's kind of shaped me as, as a player and as a coach. And, um, then I got, I got uh, picked up on waivers, uh, not too long after that, three years into there and into, uh, Atlanta, um, and Atlanta Thrashers and, and, you know, they had a different kind of core, you know, that was Ilya Kolchuk, that was, um, Patrick Stefan, that was, uh, Danny Heatley, uh, Mark Savard. And and so, dude, dude, yep. There's there's people out here that don't know who the Atlanta Thrashers were. <laughs> you know? That's true. That's like, true. You know there That's are true. so yeah. They they yeah. were an expansion yeah, the Winnipeg, team. The, the AKA Winnipeg Jets. No, that's where they moved back to. So uh, there we but go. Yeah, go but back back then, similar to my experience, that when I went uh, the last couple years with Ottawa, it's not like the expansion uh, teams. Uh, that we, that we've seen of late in Vegas and uh, uh, Seattle, 
uh, you had some tough, tough years, but you know, you go from a culture that a, a hall of fame culture to, uh, something that, you know, they, you were building something from the foundation up. How challenging was that? Yeah, that, that was, honestly, I remember being there the first week and played a couple games and just kind of saw some different things. And I, I remember thinking, I can't believe this is the same league. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and again, I'm not, this is not a slight on the player. No. I, this, they don't know what they don't know. And right. so, like you said, they're, they're young, they're raw, they're navigating through it together. They don't, they don't have the players. So, so Bob Hartley was there again. He was there, the coach. That's the main reason why he went there. Cause he, he used me as a third line checker, but, but so he, he's going from a hall of fame standard and, and he's trying to recreate that in Atlanta. And, and this is where I always say, like your, your leaders are going to set the ceiling and, and, the leaders that were there at that time, they, they, they didn't have the same qualities. You know, they, they, you know, all those players that I mentioned, none of them are Hall of Famers, and that's not a slight on them. That's just that's the reality of how hard it is to get in the Hall of Fame. They were good players, mm-hmm. but but the talent, you know, I don't think really matched up with the the other qualities I mentioned earlier, and so their ceiling wasn't nearly as high. And so there were some talented players, some good players, but. The, that winning pedigree and culture, which took a lot of time to create in Colorado, because a lot of the, the lumps, what people have to remember, went through and was in Quebec, the Nordiques, went before they moved. That's where they took their lumps. Like Joe was probably a minus 20 or minus 30 back then. And, you know, oh no, all these guys that went through the hard times and they were just on the upswing. And then 96, they moved to Colorado. They trade for Patrick Waugh and Mike Keenan and the rest is history. They, they win the Stanley Cup and, and now it's like, you know, they're rolling. But, um, but that was, they took their lumps there. And, and, you know, once you win now, you have that pedigree and, and they've been through it. You know, you can't substitute experience. You got to go through it. And now those elite players went through the grind and then won in 96, then they won again in 2001. And then, you know, so they, they built it together. The core was there together and they just kept adding um, because of the, there's no salary cap. They were able to continue to add, but that, right. that it was a culture shock. It really was because, like I said, you don't know what you don't know. I, I, the only experience I knew in the NHL was in Colorado, and that was the standard. And so you, that's what you knew. And then all of a sudden you went to another place, and, and it was very eye-opening. Let's put it that way. It, it just, but they were, way, they were years behind. That's all that was. It was just lack of experience, lack of winning pedigree. You know, the, those uh, 1% players that had the total package, they didn't really have any of that. They're good players, just not enough of the, the leadership type players. And so... They were, you know, they were trying to find their way also. Uh, it was a great opportunity for me because I got to play more. You know, I played 12, 13, 14 minutes a night. There's a checking role with Bobby Holik and Pascal Dupuy, and it was great for me. Um, but the offset was, you know, we didn't win as much. That's probably why I was playing more, you know. So right. uh, it, that that's just what it was. And then, uh, you know, and then after that, I went to, I got traded to Anaheim in 08, 09, and, uh, I got there all banged up, had a couple surgeries. I actually missed the whole year. I had double sports hernia surgery again, and then I had hip surgery that year, and, and uh, so it was a lost year. And then I, I tried to give it one last kick at a Buffalo camp and, and uh, went to the minors in Portland, Maine, and played a whole season there, and then I knew I was done. I knew I just I had nothing left in the tank, and I laid it out. And But I had a major passion for coaching for a lot of years. I I did. And and I was hurt a lot. So I always had to think about stuff that, you know, what would I want to do if my career didn't didn't go as planned. So if I'm looking at hockey DB, um, you know, was it frustrating? I mean, I, there were, there were, there was a, a pocket of years where, I knew I was an everyday NHL player, and yep. the whole the whole year I didn't have to worry about getting sent down or whatever. But I mean, you you have you know significant uh, you know AHL time, yep, sprinkled in in oh, a, yeah. you know some magical you know years. I mean, did did you ever just say you know I'm sick of this, and if I'm not going to be an everyday NHL player, I'm out of here. 
You know what? No, like I, so I, I put my time in early. I was four years pretty steady in the AHL. And again, I was just trying to redefine myself as a player, really. It was hard because I'd go to the American League, I'd be playing top line minutes or top two line minutes, power play, everything. And then I'd go to the NHL and I'd have to play six minutes a night. So, yeah. and then have to be a different player too, like physical fight, like do just, you know, be an antagonizer, do different things. So it was, that was what I had to really learn. And, it was it was difficult. Um, you know, I played over four hundred games in in the in the American League uh, with playoffs and everything, and I played over three hundred games with playoffs in the NHL. So I had a good good mix, really, of both. And and I'm so thankful for that because I, man, I got a good taste of riding the bus and eating soggy subs and and cold pizza and bad salads and um eight nine hour bus rides and then playing a three o'clock game after you know three and three weekends and so i appreciated <laughs> every day that i walked in the nhl and i could see my jersey on a hook and I, I i don't i never ever walked in that room and took it for granted i never was like well yeah i've arrived i i always felt like i was fighting for my life anyway just to stay uh, atlanta i established myself a little bit which was nice but I never felt comfortable, and I think that was a good thing. Um, I never felt like I had arrived, and and because the moment if I got comfortable, I think that's when you create bad habits and you take it for granted and you don't put the work in like you need to. So um, I was lucky in that sense. I never got that comfort, but I felt my last year in the minors. I always said if 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 I lose that passion to compete and recklessness, I got to quit. And I remember talking to about or thinking about that, you know, my late twenties, by the time I was in my early thirties and I was captain in the American league and I knew I could play another few more years and, you know, squeeze out another, but I'm like, you know what? I'm taking someone's job because I, I don't have it. I don't have that passion to compete. I, I, I didn't have that recklessness that was required. I, I didn't feel like I felt like such a shell of myself as a leader. And, and I, but then I had a strong desire to pass, uh, to coach. So, I was going to coaching clinics before my career ended, actually. Um, you know, I'd, I'd go to, uh, I was calling old coaches. I had Todd McClellan in junior, so I'd call him. I, I had actually had a Mike Babcock in world juniors. I'd call him. Just, hey, what do I need to do if I want to get into coaching? Actually, my last year in, in pro, um, playing in the minors, the strength coach slash video guy, I sat with him for a month. And uh, I had to stay there for a month because I had testicular cancer. Uh, I found out right before playoffs that year, and oh, uh, I didn't. I didn't share it with my team. We actually were fortunate; we lost in the first round. But I, I found out I had testicular cancer, and and so, anyways, after we lot got bounced out, I, I had surgery and and uh, had to do radiation later in the summer and all that. But everything is good. Anyways, awesome. my point is, I knew that I wanted to coach, and I remember talking to uh, the, his name was Kevin, and I'm like, Kevin, can you teach me how to do video? Because they're like, look, if you're going to get the coaching, you're going to learn how to do video. So I learned how to cut a video, a tape, um, just because I knew that was what the job required. So um, I went through that summer, still training, going through radiation, uh, but knowing that I didn't really want to play, I really wanted to coach, and I ended up landing the, the job with the Columbus Blue Jackets um, farm team in Springfield as assistant coach. So it all worked out, and that's kind of when my, my career started as a coach in 2010. But, uh, but yeah, there's, there's just little things that I had a passion about it that I tried to kind of learn on the fly and, and as I got into coaching. So um, heading into the coaching thing, I was two years assistant coach in Springfield, uh, and then I got promoted to head for two years, and then I, you know, I went to Columbus as an assistant coach under Todd Richards. He got let go after my first year, and that's when John Tortorella came in. Uh, and actually, when I took the job in in uh, the NHL, it wasn't to fast track it at all. I, I felt like I needed to go there to kind of learn. I wanted to get under a head coach and kind of absorb it. And uh, you know, I never wanted to go to the NHL as a head coach without any experience in the NHL because I feel like it's it's a tall task. And so I went there and thinking I was going to learn that from Richie and he was great. But then obviously we didn't have as, enough success to get fired and uh, he got fired and then Todd or John Tortorella comes in and not knowing the circumstance there, I didn't really know much about him other than what I'd seen on TV. And uh, I was thinking, I remember coming home to my wife going, I may not be here very long. You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And and uh, I, I, my first call was to uh, an assistant coach that I knew well in Vancouver, and he assured me that I'm going to love him. 
and and he was he was spot on. Yeah, he's one of my dearest friends now, John Tortorella, uh, for the rest of my life, and he, I owe him so much. And uh, that he's got this persona that you know this image that people think, and it's he's very misunderstood. Let's put it that way. He is an incredible man, uh, very good at what he does. Uh, cares about you, his players, your family, everything, and and so I had the the privilege of coaching with him for six years, and um, and then after he left, I was promoted to head, and that, that was the last two years, and then uh, got fired at the end of the last year, and so you know it, as the business goes, you don't have success. There was a lot that went into that, but um, it was a, it was a rough season in a lot of ways, but you know that's what you sign up for, you know, and and uh, I've I've Man, I've learned a lot. That that was the end of my 26th straight year, and and I uh, decided to take this year off of coaching. Um, you know, I had some great opportunities potentially, and I, I had to kind of put that aside. My wife was dealing with some some health issues, so that was that was priority one, and so that's what we've been doing this year. And I'm still in coaching. I'm coaching my uh, help coach, I should say, my son's 12 12 U uh, travel team. So that's been a blast. I, I never thought I'd get that opportunity. That's been amazing. So, what value do you bring that team? Well, <laughs> I uh, you yeah, guys got like an unreal power play, or <laughs> no? See here for me, I, 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 I took a real different route with my son. Um, he, I never really coached him, and and that was by design. I I didn't, I didn't want him to to play because I played. Um, I loved it. And no one had to push me. No one had to to drive me to play. Uh, I just I couldn't get enough of it as a kid, and and it wasn't fair to me. You know, I I believe God blessed me with some talents in hockey, and and everybody's different. And so with my son, um, I I was very hands off. And if you wanted to skate, great. If you didn't, we'd go months without it. it didn't matter. But he kind of got the bug about three, four years ago and started to play, really wanted to get in. We put him into the learn to play programs here and, and, um, and he, he really started to like it. He got a little bit older and started to be more aware of the players. And so it's, uh, my son's really raw. Uh, I love watching him play because he's got, I, I, I try to teach him more about values of being a teammate, about the importance of being selfless. Um, you know, working hard, paying attention. Um, you know, there's no yelling at the ref. There's no, you, you, there's no laying on the ice. You get up. There's no embellishing. There's no over celebrating. Like to me, you know, whether he he goes on to to do something in hockey or not, that's it is what it is. You, you know how hard it is to get to the NHL. In fact, how hard it is is to get a college. Um, you know, uh, uh, to play for a high end college team. That's hard. Let yeah. alone turn it into a career. So for me, going through it, the importance of values and stuff that you can carry forward in your life. Um, you know, I, I, you know, one thing I can be very upfront about is I, I found Christ later in my life. I was I was a little bit of a lunatic mostly my life, and and learned made a lot of bad choices <laughs> and learned a lot of valuable lessons. But um, you know, May twenty second, two thousand eleven, I gave myself to the Lord and. That changed me. Uh, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. That completely changed me. And um, not that my life's perfect now, because it, it's not. But how I look at the, the game and how I look at life is much different now. And 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 I always thought that that hockey gave me everything, but really, God blessed me with all these skills and the ability to do this sport. And and so looking at it now, I, I my my main priority is is to teach him stuff that he can carry. If it's in hockey, great. He's going to be a great teammate. He's going to be selfless, and and hopefully he he, he touches that. And if he doesn't, then those skills are going to carry him forward in, into life. Because you know, from what I'm aware of, there's only about about 700 jobs, 800 jobs maybe in the NHL right now, and and you know, there's five six billion people, so the odds aren't in your favor. So there's yeah. There's lots of things to do in this life, and and he's you know he's like a normal eleven year old and and going through it. But I get to coach him this year and, and be part of that with that team. And um, you know we we don't focus on the X's and O's and that. We give him some structure, basic structure. But you know really we focus on on the values of the game. And and it's hard. I told him I said you know we talk with the staff and he said we're our team's going to be different. We're gonna 
we're going to really do things differently. We're not, it, we're not over celebrating. We're not, we run up the score. We're not, we're not going to be that team. And, and it's hard. I, I get it, you know, but I just think there's so much value to that for these kids. Um, and, and something that they could carry forward to the next team they go on and into life. And if we can help them in that at all, of course, we're going to coach them and do all that stuff. But at the end of the day, these life skills, I think, are so much greater than, than, than the X's and O's that, you know, if they don't make it, that the game's gone. And, but the, the value stuff, they can carry forward. And, and so that's been the real fun in this is watching our team kind of grow and come together and and uh, there's lots of coaching moments and uh that's been fun i never thought i'd get this opportunity but i i am so thankful that i've been able to to go out and coach my son and be part of it and go to these you know taking a year off it's it's a whole nother world i get to go to these tournaments and be with them and um you know my my wife and daughter stay back and they take care of the farm which i'm so thankful for and so it's been an incredible experience this has uh been one of my my most uh, favorite years and and who would have thought it would have been out of pro hockey and um but but to have that opportunity has been been incredible that's awesome um you know i i think that yep you know, we haven't chatted in over two decades i had i mean yeah. i knew yep. from a distance what you were doing uh after you retired that you were coaching you know i see you on tv here and there but um, just hearing you talk about that, um, I if you know I I wasn't hanging around the phone seeing if you were going to call you know and offer me a job when you were you know an <laughs> NHL coach or anything. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I would have turned you down because I I just I enjoy the the the, the technical part of the game, and in addition to teaching kids how to skate and have good edge work and, you know, stick handling, shooting and stuff, you know, the, the things that you're talking about is how to be a good teammate, you know, uh, how to conduct yourself when you're really mad, you know, when you're yep. a leader and stuff like that. So, yep. um, I, I, I think that you're, you're the same. I mean, even if you coach at the highest level, you know, there, there's, there's still you're still teaching that stuff aren't you Brad oh, I mean you're, oh yeah how yeah, to be the yeah. professional yes. and yes it, that, that never ends and you know we were the youngest team in the league last year second youngest team so they're they're it, it's they're they're young men with making millions of dollars a lot of them and and the and it's different now like the with analytics with social media with all these things that gets thrown in their face and, and the pressures it's it's different than when i played i mean thank goodness there wasn't analytics when i played uh I, because i don't think i would have played my 300 games it would have been probably cut in half or, or less so um that's just where the landscape is right now and everything's transparent and and i think i think the the, the hard thing that these guys the expectations and and everything is is instant gratification and and they want it now and everybody tells them they should have it now and patience is a really really challenging thing for a lot of players uh for people in general just it's instant gratification they want instant results they want instant you know they want the big paycheck they want you know all this stuff and you know i i live and die but it's like you just you can't substitute experience you just got to go through things and i think as a coach and as a player all those experiences grow you and 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 they grow you if they're handled properly and not that you're going to handle all of them perfectly because i think that's where where i know i didn't handle a lot of those situations properly i i look back at when i was a leader i was you know i was captain of team canada twice out of three years i i was captain of my team and and you know my second year pro and 21 years old in, in the american league i was captain i was captain of my junior team for two years i would you know and I look back at how I was a leader then and I kind of cringe and I'm like, man, I, I fell short in so many ways. But, you know, I talk to my old coaches and they're like, look, you're young, you, you're learning. And that's, that's the thing. It, it, it's, it's how you, how you learn and, and are you humble enough to take advice and, and are you, are you still trying to grow? And, and, and again, this is where I, I believe God plays a big role in my life now is it, it's, I, I look at it so much differently now. Um, I have a major passion to just help people. I just want to help them. And I want to, 
I want to grow them and I want to, you know, it's, the sport is a, is an incredible sport. I love hockey and it's always been part of my life, but you know, I, I love people and, and I, I, I just want to help a group and, and, you know, build relationships, build trust. Well, to build trust takes time and, and not that I'm perfect at it either, but it's, you know, the, the, the thing about the NHL, again, patience isn't, is not a, it's not a trait that most people have now. It's it's like you want to win yesterday. You want to you want to take you know two steps at a time instead of one. You want to grow and and you know and I get it. You know that's it's it's a it's a business where it's results based. It's um, when you're winning, everybody's patient. When you're losing, patience runs up really quick. Oh, and panic button, panic button. <laughs> yeah it's uh it's interesting to be part of when when you go through that but but again i've always said this i i last year was one of the hardest years of my life uh with my family with uh, with what my wife was dealing with with our team you know we had 600 man games lost it, yeah. it was just it was a train wreck it, it was and you know we're, we're fielding teams that uh it, 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 I mean, they were American Hockey League teams. I remember in Philly one night, we had 12 rookies playing. Like, that's insane. Yeah. Um, you know, so in that sense, uh, I, I I look back and I, I know I could have handled some things differently and, and how I would do it differently now. And it's not X's and O's. It's, it's, but I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have chosen that year. If somebody came to me and said, hey, look, choice A is, you know, you're, you're – you're going to be a playoff team. You're going to take a step. You're going to sign a three-year extension. You know, you're going to continue to grow. And uh, or choice B would be: look, your 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 wife's going to be real sick. It's going to be a high-stress year. Your your team's going to be decimated. You're going to get fired and canned. I'm taking A every time. It's not a question. I'm choosing A. But there was another plan, and and that plan was B. And sometimes you don't you don't see how fruitful those plans are. And I, I am so grateful that B was chosen because I've I've learned more from that experience and and what I would do differently and, and how God's kind of led me through that and what that looks like and to step away from the game now after 26 years and see it with different lenses and and it's been it's been life changing really and I'm grateful that 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 year happened um, not that I would have chosen it like I said if by choice I wouldn't have chosen it but B was chosen for me, and I'm very grateful for that because it, I, I'm here now, and and I was able. These, these last nine, ten months have been incredible, and what I've been able to do and being available at home and help my family and and go through the process I've gone through, and so those things, those things are 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 they they help you grow, and and that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier. They if it's handled properly, and again, I, I, I say this not saying I've handled everything perfectly because I haven't, but if you allow that opportunity to grow in, in the adversity, it can really serve you well moving forward. And I think without having gone through that and, and what I've gone through, I don't, I couldn't have grown like I have, I believe now. And, I'm, and that's something that I, I'm very grateful for. And, um, and I look forward to whatever lies ahead because I don't know what it's going to be yet. Nope. And, you know, the, we once you figure out that you don't know what it's going to be, but also that there's probably going to be some uphill challenges that you're going to have to go through. Not probably, there's going to be. And to be able to have a relationship with the guy upstairs, right, and like you said, uh, you know, to to just give some guidance during those times, um, you got to work at it. So. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we learn and grow. We, we get experience. Uh, 56, the, the fixed 56 year old, uh, coach Lance Petlick is completely different than the, the 46 or the 36 year old one. Um, and that's, that, that's what makes us us. So, you know, we're already close to an hour, dude. And I, I feel like we could just, you know, rent a place up in Lutzen and just chat for like <laughs> a weekend. Yeah. You know. You know. <laughs> yeah. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to ask you. Think of this rapid fire. You don't have to like be super quick, but uh, just gonna throw some questions at you and just sure. give me your thoughts on it. So, okay. 
Um, I'm going to say a quote because I listened to a, uh, a podcast you were on and this was, uh, you said this, that it takes a lifetime to build a reputation and a moment to ruin it. Uh, just give us a few paragraphs on that. Yeah, I, I think it's doing things the right way over and over and over and just be very conscious of your decisions. Um, you know, because you, you know, whether you're young, uh, getting older, whatever that looks like in your life, you, we have the ability and of free will and we get to choose. Uh, and so, like I said, I, I, I have not been perfect and, um, and I can look back and, and kind of cringe and, and have regrets, but I think those things have shaped me. And, but if you, if you're staying humble, um, Staying meek, staying, uh, keeping being a selfless person, uh, understanding why you're doing things, and and the more you put those things into play, um, you know you you, you you won't have any regrets, and and um, you'll never regret doing the right thing, and always regret doing the wrong thing. And yeah. It's something that I stand by, and I got lots of those wrong things regrets, and and but you know I. I I know I've been forgiven and I look by there and now I move forward and grow. And so the, those opportunities are always there in front mm -hmm. of us and they are, and you, you have a choice and, and quite honestly, it's going to be hard. Um, it's, it, that's just a fact. It's going to be hard because we're selfish by nature. We, we have fleshly desires. We, we, we want things, you know, uh, taking the path. Uh, the easiest path, uh, you know, of least resistance. That's human nature. That's what we want. But oftentimes your growth only starts when the adversity hits. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, most times until you go through it. Uh, they say, they say, you know, character is revealed or character is grown. I said character is revealed in those moments. And, 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 and oftentimes we don't handle it well. It's what you do with it after. And then, because, it's not if, it's when. It's inevitable. A, a, a new challenge, a new storm is coming. And it's how you're going to. Do you, did you learn from the last storm and to help you get through this one? And so that's life. That's on, on, on the ice. That's in, in your marriage. That's in you know your relationship with your kids. Whatever that looks like. There's this, another storm coming. And you know if you're humble enough to learn from it, it you're, you're going to grow and you're going to handle that situation much better. Fall 7. Rise eight. I love that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. That's right. You were a player in the NHL and also a head coach. I mean, you, you've had a career in coaching as well, as much as you did yep. as a player. Uh, you have to pick one. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't ride the Ooh. fence on both of this. Okay. Ooh. So yeah. you're, you're on a, you're on a, I don't know, a, a wakeboard or what do they call those? Uh, when you're doing it on, on the snow, um, Oh, uh, snowboarding, snowboarding, you know, yep. you're, you're on the half pipe or whatever, and you got to go to one side or the other. What, yep. what position was more challenging for you? Ooh, gosh, I think coaching, coaching is more challenging because as a player, you, I could prepare. I just had to worry really about me. That's it. Like, I mean, I had to prepare. I knew. I knew if I trained, I put the hours in. I, I those were things that I could I could um, prepare for always, and I had the ability to do that. If I didn't put the work in, then my chances went down of, of achieving that goal. So as a as a player, it was hard in the sense of the work, and, and but it was easy because I just had to worry about me. As a coach, especially as a head coach, oh boy, it's you're, you're that umbrella gets very big you're you know you're worried about all your players you're not just you're, you're really not worried about yourself at all it's it's about your coaching staff the medical staff you're managing up there's media uh there's 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 a 22 guys in your room that you're trying to build trust and get to know um your game planning you're doing video you're you know to me no question it was that the coaching is the word that i would use for coaching especially as a head coach is consuming very, very consuming. Um, and you're spread very thin uh, of, you know, your time, your energy. It's, it's exhausting mentally uh, to just because of so much that you have to 
oversee. And as a player, yes, it's, it, trust me, it was hard, challenging, but I knew I just had to prepare me. I come to the rink as a player, practice is ready to go. They tell me where I need to be. Uh, I know where the meals are going to be. I know that, uh, you know, my workouts are put out in front of me. So it was, in that sense, it was much easier. Okay. Uh, World Juniors. Yeah. You you uh, won a gold. I don't think that you're a uh, cat. I, hold on. <laughs> it, it was cheaper. <laughs> you know, can a guy ask her a question without well, just, just want to make sure. Get it right. That's all. Okay, was that already posted on Instagram and you you heard it? <laughs> I don't have Instagram, so we're good. <laughs> but okay, you went through the experience as a yep. uh, a support player. Uh, yep. Your first round at the World Juniors. Uh, the second year, you were captain. Yep. Okay, so you are going into the gold medal game. You just you you know you're going in. How how was that experience of winning the gold and now, but you weren't a captain. Now you're a captain. You know, what was the message that you were telling people? Uh, what was going in your head? Uh, how can future captains, uh, participants in the world junior uh, tournament benefit from what you're going to say right now? I tried to learn from the previous captains, right? I had Nolan Baumgartner, and, and, uh, but we had really good players that I learned from that in that first year. And I tried to carry that to the second year. Quite honestly, I was terrified the second year when I got named captain. I was excited for about five minutes. <laughs> and then I was terrified because Canada had won four gold medals in a row. And I was part of the fourth one. I'm going, oh, gosh, I'm the captain now. What if we, what if we don't win, right? So that... That part of it was like, I felt the weight of it. I remember my first game. I was horrible the first game in that tournament. I remember Mike Babcock calling me in and basically saying, what, what the heck's wrong with you? And I'm like, I, I, I was trying to do everything. You know, I, I felt like I had to score. I had to hit everything. I had to talk on the bench. And it was like, he's like, take a breath. Like, you're, you're a captain for a reason. Just be you. And that helped. I From that point on, I just accepted who my role was. I didn't have to be the top scorer. Not that I was going to be anyway, but... Just understand you were made captain for a reason. So just be yourself. And so when we got to the gold medal game, I really tried to keep keep the mood. I, you don't have to focus because everybody's focused. They understand the goal. It was more trying to diffuse the nerves and, and enjoy the excitement of, and the opportunity of it. And, and that's all I really talked about with our group. I remember talking just, just with players and saying the opportunity of, of putting a ring on our finger and, and being able to shake hands and, and, and have that bond forever. That's, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, but we shouldn't be scared of it, you know? And, and, um, and we weren't quite honestly, my second year, we probably shouldn't have won. Mark Denis was our goalie and he was, I mean, he was lights out. We beat the U S in the final, but they were the, they played better than us. I think we shut them out two nothing or three nothing, but I think Mark had four or five, stopped on breakaways they they were a much better team than us in, in that game and, and we were fortunate and so we won i i remember winning I, I will remember this like it's tomorrow yeah like it's just like a few hours ago i remember we won and you know they pulled cigars or something and I, and I remember just sneaking out of the room and i went to the bench and i sat down and i just i was exhausted mentally and just relieved that we won I was just sat there and I was like, oh, thank goodness we won, you know, because I didn't want to be that captain that lost. <laughs> and and not a minute behind me or two minutes behind me, Mike Babcock came out. And I remember looking back at Mike and just saying, well, we did it. And he goes, thank God we did. You know, because I think he felt it too. You know, and you're, when you, the, the, like you said earlier, the pressure and, and it's an opportunity, but it is it is a Super Bowl for, for kids at our age. And that it, the coverage is in, incredible. Um, and I can't imagine now with social media and, and I know this year Canada didn't have a good tournament. So gosh, those poor kids, you know, I, I was fortunate to, to cross the finish line every time, uh, in first place, but I can't imagine losing it and what that would feel like. So yeah, that, the, the relief, it was more relief when, when we won it, um, than, uh, exuberance, I guess would be the word. Yeah. You say that you don't, you don't know what it would feel like. Yeah, you do. And here's our next question because <laughs> you just, you just told yes, it last last year was just wrapped in a different paper. Um, oh, yeah. yep. So, you know, you 
every coach going into a, a season doesn't matter what level you have a, you know you have goals you have objectives and everyone wants to to win the national championship to win the stanley cup uh to win the the, the square day fargo tournament you know you <laughs> as a youth yeah. but sure. uh what happens when you're the leader the head coach and you know, I mean, you, you've said it that your your team is driven by your top players. What happens when your one percenters don't produce? I mean, you last year you didn't have many, if any, of your one percenters, but the ones that you did fill in with, those were one percenters at one point during their career at some level, and you know how how do you balance if if you're you know you, you you're just how do you motivate people when shit this isn't going well? Yep, you know, and so I'll share with you what I've learned from that experience. Again, it wasn't an X's and O's thing. I think, um, and again, this comes back to my faith, and because and it always does now. Um, the the opportunity to be a light in the dark, and I I know for a fact I I got frustrated. I got. I uh, lost hope. I got dejected at times. Um, and, you know, I'd come back and swing, but I, it, it wore on me in a way that I wish I could run it back and go through because what those players needed was was guidance in the way of of not just positivity because that, that, that is such a lame word to me, and, and I don't mean that in any disrespectful way. I just think it's it's so much deeper than, well, just, you know, bring a smile and be positive because that's easy to say and hard to do. But I think in the, in the opportunity of adversity, there's so many incredible lessons to be learned and how we handle it. And I think we, we, we navigated most of it. Um, but as the leader of that, I could have done a way better job of think of bringing the group together from, and I mean like from management down um, through the players, through us. And I think when you when you have a season like that, if I went through that again, I would I would treat it much differently. And um, everybody's watching you. You know, every every day you come to the rink as the, the head coach, you're bringing the energy to the room. Um, whatever energy you're carrying, that's what you're bringing to the rink, and what you're bringing to your players, and what you're bringing to your staff. So if you're down and, and tired and lethargic and gassed and frustrated, guess what? They feel it. They all feel it. And you think you're hiding it. Uh, my family felt it. And so, you know, now I, with my relationship, I, I, I fully trust. I, there's a verse, Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. And I'll recite it right now. It's, it's blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree that's planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes for his leaves remain green. And is not anxious in the year of the drought, for he does not cease to bear fruit. I had that verse in the back of a journal, and I never really, you know, I liked it. I didn't really understand. I understand that verse now. I yeah. mean, it, 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 this was the year of the drought. And it's like, but you have an opportunity to bear fruit. You don't have to be anxious. Like, there's all these opportunities that I squandered, I felt like, when I look back and reflect on it. And I think, man, I, that's that's the stuff. Not, I guess, yeah, the regret that I, I regret that I didn't. In those moments, you know, um, and now I, I know where my roots are at. I, I know, uh, I know how I would, uh, with guidance from the Lord, how I would treat that situation differently in, in those. So, so I'd say, remember, you know, reset yourself and, and, and make sure that, you know, I, I guess, what is your why? You know, why are you doing it? Is it, if it's about you, if it's about, you know, saving face, is it about surviving? You're probably going to fail. You know, you're you're either going to hurt relationships. You're not going to do things the, the the proper way. But if it's selfless, if it's you're humble and, and you're motivated by total team, I mean, you're you're going to be all right. And, and and again, whatever the outcome is, that's fine. You can you can leave with your head high. Uh, but but that's what I would say is making sure look for those opportunities in adversity to to be different because everybody kicking doors and slamming doors and and i mean it, it's childish it, it it's that's what five-year-olds do um because they don't know any better and as a grown man and that's not that's not going to solve anything no it's not 
but it sure feels good in the moment. But you know, <laughs> yeah. And then you, yeah. you have that pity party, and then you move on. Um, all right, dude. I mean, it's we're almost like we're over an hour, and it's like it seems like it's like been like a half an hour. All right, tell me a little bit about. Um, so first, I know you're taking a, a year off, uh, yep. attending yep. to your wife. So I hope that you you said that things are, are, are progressing there. Talk a little, a little bit. bit about your, um, you mentioned you rescue horses, dogs, cats. Yep. Uh, that's a big part of your guys' uh, family's life. Yeah, so we started uh, several years ago. We got this farm here, and, and um, we, we, we became associated with the horse rescue just by, by accident. Really, we were doing, a, we were volunteering some time at a, at a dog rescue thing, and, and there was a bunch of different groups there and this uh, Bella run equine was there. And so we got talking to to them and then uh, within a year we had our first horse and uh, they, they rescue um, horses from slaughter auction, horses that are just basically taken for meat. They're put on a truck and sent out to different countries just for meat. And so um, they're great horses. People are just done with them. And what they do is they go in and they buy as many horses as they can. They rehabilitate them because a lot of them are in a rough shape and then they uh, rehome them to the right home. So, that's what we've been doing. We, we, you know, we only have three and, and one's only from the slaughter auction. The other two are just different kind of rescues, but, um, our dogs are all rescues. The cats are all rescues, you know? So, um, yeah, it, 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 everyone's always like, Oh, what are you doing with all your time? I laugh. I'm like, I don't have extra time. I, I have, I'm busy and, and I love being busy. I, I, you know, between the farm, my family, um, doing a little bit of coaching. It like it's, it's, it's a lot. That's about, that's about it. You don't have that's much it. else. Yeah, that's life. It's life, right? So it's, but I mean, it's been an awesome year that way. So no, we, we've been a part of that for several years now. And um, actually Torts, that's how he got into it because he bought a farm out here. He wanted some land and we got him on hooked up uh, with this rescue. And, and he was, he took two horses just to put them on pasture and fatten them up a little bit. And he ended up adopting them. And, and, um, and then, so now he's got three rescue horses himself and, you know, that's how he got, he's always was into dogs, but he got into the horse rescue stuff because of, of the group that we had met. So. Sorry, I was just having a drink of water. That's all right. Um, dude, I, I'm just bowing down right now and just saying thank oh, you no. for doing your, oh. um, uh, uh, what you're doing. Um, you know, one, one important message that. And I, I'll say the same thing. There's a lot of people, you know, I've done podcasts and one question that people ask, a common one is, would you change anything? Would you do anything different? Um, and no, I wouldn't. You know, growing up, I've done some stupid stuff, but that's what shapes us. That's what makes the special stuff special. Um, so thanks for, you know, this sharing, I'm sure, a lot of stuff that, uh, at the time was pretty challenging to get through, but um, you, you're you're providing suggestions to others on maybe how to navigate through some of these challenging times um, from a different angle, from a different perspective, uh, from a different viewpoint. Yeah, they're, they're, honestly, they're, they're truly opportunities, and and if you re, if you realize and remember that that is the opportunity for growth growth i've always said this as even as as a as a coach a lot that you know winning's easy it's not easy to win but when you're winning it you know the the troubles are less there's always problems but it's everyone's in better moods and everybody's having fun and you know they you know kind of laugh things off i said so winning's easy it's it's when you lose it's like that's when you you, you truly got to buckle down and that's when you're going to you start looking around and, and, and I took last year, I watched and I, and we started losing early. We had expectations. We signed Johnny Goudreau and we, we weren't ready to take the next step. Um, but you know, but the expectations we were and it didn't go as planned and we got injured and all the stuff and you start to look around and you started to see, started to see things that you wouldn't have seen if you were winning. Let's put it that way. And, yep. and for me, that was, that was very eye opening and, 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 you only learn that in those moments. And so there's, there's incredible opportunities. And, and again, throughout that year, I wasn't perfect either. I, I, I fully acknowledge that. And, 
and know I would, would treat that, those situations differently. And, um, but that's, that's the thing. It, it, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to grow. And, and if you're in a leadership position, you have that, an incredible opportunity to lead that. And what people have to understand, especially the young ones, if, if you have lofty goals, doesn't, it could be hockey. It could be horse jumping. It could be, I don't know, spike ball. It could be chess. Don't matter to me, but the, the, the process is always the same where you're, you're going to have some adversity and it's how you respond to it. But if you are uncomfortable being in that space, then you're never going to have a chance to get to the higher levels because that's where the ultimate growth is. If you can't get over to that spot, uh, Barry Karn, who you might remember, a guy here, a skating instructor, but he calls it disagreeable training. Um, if you if you can't get comfortable in that space, then you're never going to have a chance to reach the higher levels in anything. Yeah, it's like I said to you prior. Like I, I knew as a player, if I ever got to that comfortable stage, I'd probably be in trouble because I, I maybe don't. Maybe your work ethic drops just five or ten percent, or maybe you just don't do that 1%. extra work. That, that, yeah, That's it. Yeah, but. I, I'm talking about doing, yeah, I don't really feel like doing, you know, you're playing and, and you get away with it one, one week or one night or, yeah. you know, and, and as soon as it drops, you know, again, it's human nature. We want to take the path of least resistance, but the problem is everybody generally that that's usually a busy road, right? And, yeah. and if you want to, if you want to get past those guys, you're going to have to maybe take the road less traveled and it's hard. I it, There's no there's no question about it. It's hard. It, it, but it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's if it was easy, you know, cliche. Everybody would do it. It's supposed to be hard, and it's yep. it's how you deal with it, and and how you and and be careful about the people you're hanging around with. You don't need people telling you what you want to hear. You need people telling you honest truth, and and then you got to be humble enough to accept that. And that's the key. It's. Don't don't go to mom and dad if they're just telling you what you want to hear. And, and I'm not saying don't go to your parents, but you, you need honest feedback and then and then be constructive with it. You know, uh, be honest with yourself. And that, I always say that, uh, something to the kids I get in front of that you will be the average of the five people you hang around with the most. Yeah, Whatever man. is important to them, that's going to be important to you. So that's right. That's right. Um, okay, I'm going to give you my little outro here in a second but yep. what you, you you rescue uh the horses and stuff is i got a yep. lot of generous people that listen to this podcast is there oh, yeah. a place where they can learn more and uh, maybe help you um doing what you're doing yeah well they're not helping me i i don't i'm, I'm blessed and and we're just helping out but like if you if you have an itch to help a horse rescue bella run equine they're in athens ohio um you know, they're always, they, I know them very well. They, they work extremely hard. They're a small foundation, but they put the work in. Uh, I've seen it. They, they're boots to the ground type people. Um, at any given time, they got 40 to 50 horses on their property and they do a tremendous job. Always, they're always looking for, for hay, you know, money for feed, money for vet bills. You know, it's, it's in a very expensive endeavor, but they're not getting rich doing it. I can tell you that. Um, yep. So Bella Run, B E L L A, Run R U N Equine, um, and that's in Athens, Ohio. Just go online and and you can donate on there. They love it. You're gonna send me that via text message, so yeah, I, I sent you a link yesterday. I think it's it should be on your text message. If not, I can send resend it. No, then you already did. I'm just saying it just so the listeners know that I'm on that crap. Okay, Perfect. that crap. This I'm on. The, I'm on it. I'm on it. People. I got you. Um, uh, Mr. Larson, the, the, this show has come to an end, my friend. Uh, I want to congratulate you on an, an amazing hockey life. Uh, you've had a journey way longer than most, and I just want to say thank you for being you and making the game of hockey so much better than when you found it. Um, if there's anything that I can do to help you and what you guys 
got going on, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. But just thank you for for sharing your journey. Uh, I know you're going to inspire a lot of people that uh, listen to this episode. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and can continued success, my friend. I appreciate. Yeah, thanks for having me on. That was great. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Brad Larson and hearing his hockey journey, both as a player and coach, and how he's doing his best to make the world and game of hockey better today than it was yesterday. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.